All right, I'm super excited today because we're making a huge change in the workshop, and that's gonna be converting these cabinets back here to a miter saw station. Now this conversion is gonna take a lot of work, so it's gonna be a multi-part series, and today we're gonna to start by building two three-drawer base cabinets, which will be the right side of the miter station. I'm Brad from Fix This, Build That. Let's get started. Now you may have seen me make a few cabinets on my channel, but today I'm really gonna lean in on the tips and tricks to make cabinet building go smoothly. I'm using 3 quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. I think cutting it on the floor using rigid foam is the best approach for me. And on the floor, you can crawl on top of the sheets, which makes reaching across the panel a lot easier. I'm turning three sheets of plywood into eight or nine smaller pieces can get confusing. So I use sticky notes to label everything. Now each section of plywood gets a number, and then I list what parts from my plan that I'll get out of that piece. And when I cut down a piece that's already been labeled, I'll transfer the parts it contains onto a new sticky and mark it off of the original piece. And I also use some arrows to show which edges are the factory edges because I know they're almost always straight and at a right angle to each other. <laughs> now this may seem like overkill, but I make my plans with a very efficient plywood layout to save on materials. So cutting a part from the wrong panel might mean that you have to buy a whole new sheet of ply to fix it. And I'm a natural organizer and overthinker so this tickles all the right spots for me. Now I can go to the table saw and with a few cuts using those arrows as reference, I get really clean parts for the cabinet sides and bottoms. Basically what I'm doing is I always cut the panels a little bit oversized. That factory edge is typically pretty straight, but it's pretty rough. So it's not gonna work out great when you get into assembly and the connections there. So I cut it a little bit oversized using that rough factory edge against the fence first, and then I will go down to final size and cut off just a little sliver. And I do that so that every side of the panel will have a nice, clean, fresh table saw cut edge on it, and it's gonna make joinery a lot easier. I grab two of the sides and I pick the best faces for the exterior. And then I mark the inside lower corners of each of them. So when I cut my toe kicks, I actually have a left and a right with the good faces pointing outward. I like using a combination square to mark notches like this since it makes layout more repeatable. Now you can do a few setups on the bandsaw and get repeatable cuts, but I find it faster to just knock these out with a jigsaw. And these cuts don't have to be perfect since they're just going to be holding the toe kick. I jump back to the table saw and I rip some of the other panels to width so that I could get the next set of parts. We want to make sure that the supports are the same size as the bottom because if they're not, then your cabinet will flare out and your drawers won't fit right. There's two better options. One if you have a stop lock on your miter saw and one if you don't. So if you don't have a stop lock on your miter saw, you can just set the support down on your piece and then mark exactly where it lines up. And now you can cut right on that line and not worry about any air on your tape measure. The other option is setting up a stop lock with your miter saw. So the biggest benefit of using a stop lock is getting consistent parts every time you cut it. And when I'm gonna be cutting eight of these parts, it's gonna be nice to know that they're all exactly the same size. I always square the end first to get a fresh face and then cut the rest of the parts from the board on the miter saw. And even though I didn't show it here, it's a good idea to check the first part off the saw and confirm that that stop lock is right where you want it before you make the rest of the cuts. And next up, it was time for joinery for the carcass. Now, I don't use it a ton, but I have a Craig Foreman on the underside of my flip top cart. And you can get plans for the flip top cart from my website. But if you want a Foreman, head over to Woodcraft, the sponsor of today's video. Now, Woodcraft has a full lineup of Craig products, and you can check them out in store at one of their 70 plus metro stores around the US. And if you aren't near one of those stores, you can browse the lineup as well as thousands of other woodworking tools and supplies on their website. I'll have a link below to all the tools that I use for this build for you to check out. And thanks to Woodcraft for being an awesome sponsor of my channel. I ready for assembly now and I actually brought over my outfeed table from the back of my table saw because it is quite a bit wider than the workbench. So I do plan to make my own assembly table soon and I would love to know from you what are the features that you love about your assembly table or wish that yours had because I'm going to be designing my own and I'd love to get some input from you guys. I jumped into assembly and I used my combination square to get a consistent offset for the bottom. I love this thing and the fact that it was my granddad's tool makes it even better. There's nothing like a good hand-me-down family tool. I secured the bottom with one and a quarter inch pocket screws and then I flipped it around to attach the top supports. Now these supports will also be used to secure the top to the cabinets later. If you're having issues getting those bottom screws in place with a clamp in the way, you can always just flip it up and move it out of the way while you drive those bottom screws. 
Now, the back supports get butted up against the bottom and that upper support that I just installed. Now, these add a place to secure the cabinet to the wall in two spots and make it really stable. Now, adding screws into the supports from the top and the bottom also really solidifies the carcass and it does a great job keeping it from racking, which you'll see later. Now, I grabbed the parts for the second cabinet and the second one is always easier, right? <laughs> I really don't know what to say here. No matter how hard I try, I always seem to have at least one blunder in every project. It's okay, we're okay. But it's kind of become a fun game now. I'm just going through every project, wondering when I'm gonna get to flash up that mistakes were made banner. Am I gonna drop a panel, drill an errant hole, or maybe just slap myself in the face with a board? Who knows? So go ahead and get subscribed if you wanna see what I screw up next time, or if you just need a little reminder that somebody else out there is on the struggle bus with you. And next I cut panels for the back to finish the carcass. I checked the cabinet for square and the diagonal measurements were within a 30 second of each other, so I'll call that good. So if you've cut all your pieces square into the right sizes, most of the time you're gonna be pretty dead on. But this is a great way to check before you go into it because if somehow you had the pieces messed up, you can adjust it now before you put the back on. And you definitely wanna do that before you start trying to install the drawers because if it's out of whack, then it'd be really hard to get things aligned. Let's go ahead and put the back on now. The back gets attached with glue and some good old me nails to hold it in place while the glue dries. And once the back is secured, the cabinet is really locked into place and it's going to resist racking during install. Before taking the carcass off of the bench, I mark some offcuts to beef up the base for leveling feet. I'm not sure if I'm going to actually use leveling feet on this build since the slope of the garage is pretty severe. I might make a full base to put the cabinets on so that I can raise them up high enough to be level across that whole 13 foot run. 13 feet is gonna be amazing, by the way. But if you need them, you can drill holes in the doubled up plywood and put threaded inserts in and use them as leveling feet for the cabinets. With the carcass complete, I moved on to cutting the drawers. Now there were plenty of cuts to make, and sometimes you gotta play a game of chicken between finishing the cut and tipping over your camera tripod. Now, luckily I won this game. I cut the parts to rough width first, and then I cut them down to final size using that clean edge that I just made. And to cut the parts to length, I brought in old Fred the sled instead of using the miter saw. Wide parts like this just aren't great for a fixed miter saw. I did the side parts first because I could just match their length to my drawer slides. And like before, I cut the pieces a little long to get one square end. Then I moved the stock block in to get a final cut and ran all the pieces through to finish up the sides. Cutting the sides for drawers is really easy because uh, you just cut them the size of the actual drawer slide, so 18 inches in my case. But cutting the fronts, that's another story because of undersized plywood. I get a ton of questions and I'm gonna make it super easy for you guys. Okay, I was editing this and my on-screen explanation was not as super easy as I wanted. So let's do this instead. Now the drawer fronts and backs follow this formula. Measure the interior width of your cabinet. Then subtract one inch for the thickness of the full extension slides, half inch on each side. Now subtract the thickness of two pieces of your drawer material, and that gives you your measurement for your fronts and your backs. And the trick that I've been using lately is to make those fronts and backs just a smidge smaller. I'm talking like a 32nd of an inch or a millimeter for my metric friends. And this will make your drawers slide smoother and avoid binding. After checking my first piece, I worked my way through the rest of them. And when those were done, I jumped back over to the foreman to drill pocket holes in the fronts and backs. I kind of felt like these parts were a little bit undecided, but I don't know. I guess they'll just choose sides in a minute. Now, after they all paired up, I grabbed a set and put the clamps on them to hold everything square. I drove in the screws to hold everything tight, and then I cut some quarter inch plywood panels for the bottoms. Now, for quick assembly, I'm using a glued and nailed on bottom. Just keep your nails three eighths of an inch out from the edges. And I put a chamfer on the bottom with a handheld router to finish off the drawers. So now putting the chamfer on the bottom of this drawer does hide it from view when you're looking at it from the side so you can't see the plywood and make sure that those nails are away far enough that the chamfer is not going to hit it. That's why we place them there. And I love this glued on bottom. It's nice and solid and doesn't rattle and it's plenty strong. I gave all the drawers the same treatment and then I moved one of the cabinets onto the bench to install the drawer slides. Now putting the cabinet on its side makes this easier so you're not fighting gravity. I spaced the slides off the bottom using a scrap of plywood and the measurements from my plans. 
If you want to build your own set of these cabinets and you want to hit the easy button, you can get the cut lists, parts diagrams, and step-by-step -step instructions. You can head down to the link below in my description to get those. And also, if you want to get the entire garage cabinet bundle, you can get that at a discount too. And I appreciate your support. I flipped the cabinet over and I used the same spacers on the other side to get my match slide positions. With the slides installed, we can put in the drawers and then just use some spacers to space everything out. The first one is gonna go right on top of a quarter inch sheet of plywood. So let's see how this looks. Oh yeah. So leaving the drawer a 30 second an inch between the slides gives it just a little bit of wiggle room and it's gonna be a lot easier for install and it's gonna slide smoother too. Now while the drawer rested on the plywood, I pulled the slides flush with the front and secured them in two spots before removing the drawer and adding a third screw to the back. Now the next two drawers use spacers set on the drawer below it for positioning. I got them mounted in the cabinet pretty easily. And to get the drawer fronts, I cut a large piece of plywood to cover the entire front of the cabinet with appropriate reveals around the edges. Then I set my saw to the height of the false drawer fronts and cut the panel into three parts. I love continuous grain looks on the front of drawers and so that's a great way to do it. And uh, I'll stack them up here and try not to let them fall like I did before. <laughs> but you can see that that grain just flows right through from all three panels and having that eighth inch kerf on the blade means I'm gonna have a perfect eighth inch reveal between all of them when I get them mounted up here. I sanded the drawer fronts and I gave them a couple coats of polyurethane. And then I prepped the cabinet while they were drying. Now, word of caution here, do not extend more than one drawer at a time or lean on an extended drawer while the cabinet is on your bench. Ooh, do not tip that over. Of course, unless you're looking for a great shop horror story to tell your buddies, because you'll get it. After drilling mounting holes in the drawer boxes, I drilled the hardware holes in the false drawer fronts. I like drilling them before they get put in place so that I can use those holes during the mounting process. All right, I'm gonna mount the drawer fronts from the bottom up and I'm gonna use this little scrap here. I've got a hole in it and I'm just gonna screw it to the bottom so I can rest that bottom shelf right on it. And it's gonna make installation a lot easier than trying to clamp everything in place. Then you can just put the fronts on in four steps. Now first I'd align the fronts and get consistent reveals on each side. Then I would hold it in place and use those hardware holes to attach the front to the drawer box. This lets me open the drawer and permanently attach the drawer front with two screws on the inside on the holes I drilled earlier. Then finally I remove those screws from the front of the hardware holes and the drawer is ready. Now the technique works great and I first saw this from my buddy Mark over at the Wood Whisper. But, excuse me, the Wood Whisper. I used an eighth of an inch spacer between the fronts to give the reveal that I needed and to finish it off. And then I could come back and drill through the drawer box for the hardware and put those handles on. On the second go around, I did find it much easier to work my way up one drawer at a time from the bottom instead of having all three drawers in there. Plus, this reduces the chances of you getting flattened like a pancake. I cleared out the spot for the cabinet to go on the wall, but I am cheating a bit here. I'm going to be using the top from the base cabinets in my garage cabinet bundle that I showed earlier. That's because the left side of my miter saw setup is going to get extended a bit, and I'll be making a new top for that left side that's a bit longer. So I decided to wait and shim everything together at once when I do that too. But these deep drawers are great for storing extra supplies and they're gonna be perfect in the miter saw station which we'll be continuing in the next video in this series. If you want plans to build your own cabinets, I've got links down below in the description. You can check that out. I wanna give a huge thank you to all the people that are joining the members in the Builders Club down below. We just launched that on YouTube, so go check that out if you wanna support the channel and get some cool rewards. But we'll catch you guys on the next video in the series.